Welcome to the Leesburg Public Library virtually. Today's Florida History Lecture is presented by Lou Vickers and is in partnership with the Florida Humanities Council. Lou Vickers has been awarded a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship for Fiction for excerpts for a novel in progress. She has also been the recipient of two Florida Book Awards and three Florida Individual Artist Fellowships for Fiction. In addition to writing Remembering Paradise Park with C. Graham, she has written the novel Breathing Underwater and three other Florida history books, Wikiwachi, City of Mermaids, Cypress Gardens, America's Tropical Wonderland, which is our wonderful program today, and Wikiwachi, 30 Years of Underwater Photography with Bonnie Georgiatis. Welcome, Lou Vickers. Okay. Okay. So now I can share my screen. What's your done? Okay, now let me, let me see here. Share my screen. Okay. Okay, can y'all see all this? Yes. Okay, so I wanted to start with a picture of Elvis because, um, you know, Cypress Gardens was so famous that maybe Elvis went. Um, he is on water skis, he's on a lake. Um, there were stories that he actually went there. This picture was in Dick Pope's office on his wall. He had a wall of all the celebrities that came there. And, uh, but, but apparently he did come under uh, extreme secrecy because they knew if people knew that he was going to come, they would like stampede the park, you know, to see him. So I wasn't able to talk to, talk to anyone who actually knew that he was there, but um, I think the photograph probably is evidence that he probably did pop in down there. Dick Pope was friends uh, with his manager, the colonel, so. So I wanted to start with that just to give you an idea of how um, famous Cypress Gardens was during that time period. It's hard probably for us to imagine now with all the Disney worlds and, and things like that, but Cypress Gardens was right up there uh, with uh, the Grand Canyon in terms of visitors uh, each year. So these are some of the famous people. That's the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were really good friends with Dick Pope and they would come to to Winter Haven and they would stay in these little motels and uh, people would drive by and try to get a glimpse of them. Um, they visit, visited there more than once. So they were frequent visitors uh, to see Cypress Gardens. And that's Tiny Tim, who you might remember. The, um, he sang that song about the tulips. He visited. Um, this woman here is Aunt Jemima. She's the woman that played the character of Aunt Jemima, and she came down to Cypress Gardens and actually did a, like a radio show from there. So she was one of the visitors uh, at Cypress Gardens. And there's uh, Carol Burnett came down there, and I actually talked to some skiers who would hang out with Carol Burnett. They would take her out skiing and stuff. And I actually, when I was going to Winter Haven, um, stayed in a a hotel that she had stayed at. It was a little run down, probably compared to what it was when she was there, but it was still kind of cool that I was staying in the same hotel that she stayed in um, back in the day, you know. Uh, I made a lot of visits to Winter Haven um, while I was working on this book project. There's Betty Davis. She was one of the visitors down there. There she is with the skiers. And so, so you know, Dick Pope, um, Dick Pope started uh, Cypress Gardens. It opened in the 30s, but way before he began Cypress Gardens, he was actually selling real estate. Um, he was involved in real estate when he was a teenager, pretty much, but his father in, was part of this um, corporation called the Haven Villa Corporation. And this was in the this was in the 20s, you know, during the Florida boom, the Florida land boom. And so you had them putting these ads in newspapers up north, trying to get people to come to Florida to buy property and stuff. And so the Haven Villa Corporation, like I said, um, Dick Pope had a connection through his father, who was one of the founders of this corporation, okay? And one of the things they would do is they would um, have all these water sports because Winter Haven is like the land of a thousand lakes. You know, there's a lot of lakes down there, obviously. Cypress Gardens is on a lake. 
And so Dick Pope was always into um, all these various water sports and trying to create new ways of uh, playing on the water. And a lot of those things were used to sell real estate. They were advertising by doing these activities. And that, that's something you'll see over and over again with Dick Pope. Dick Pope knew how to work the press, okay? He would get um, notoriety, like he would get uh, covers of magazines. He would stage events and the press would come and then they would sell real estate, okay? And it says that's Dick Pope on the aqua glider. They invented this uh, thing go up in the air um, and they got a lot of press and so people would wanna come down there and uh, look at the land and buy some property. And that's what all that was about. Here's, a, here's another actual photo of uh, this aqua glider that they created um, to go up in the air. And this was probably, this was probably mid twenties, you know, when they were doing these things. Um, there's actually footage somewhere on the internet um, of a newsreel filming one of these little escapades uh, that Dick Pope uh, participated in with his brother. His brother actually was a speedboat racer and uh, they would work out there together on these, um, on these crazy water activities. And this is just some of the press they were getting. Um, like I said, with the motor boating and everything, they were really, uh, like I said, drawing visitors down there to sell property to them. This was a, a photograph of Malcolm Pope, who was famous in his own right as a, like I said, as a, um, as a race, he was racing boats, you know, in the 20s and early 30s, and uh, really famous for that. And you can look him up um, online. And in fact, Dick Pope actually handled, um, he handled publicity for the Seahorse Corporation at one point and had moved to, to New York and uh, away from Florida to manage that, but he would always come back to Florida. Um, here's another photo from a magazine. I found a lot of these little, um, little articles about Dick Pope and he, you know, he had um, an end too with the newsreel companies because, you know, he was doing all these crazy water activities and, and um, some of you, some of you may not be aware of what newsreels are, but, you know, the 20s, 30s and 40s, they were um, these little videos that they would show before a movie, you know, and they would be like, Sometimes they were news, like actual news that was happening at the time, but a lot of times they were like sports or activities, things like that. And so uh, Dick Pope knew how to utilize that. Again, he's, he's having fun doing it. He's advertising for Seahorse uh, Motor Company, but he's also trying to get people to buy property. So he always was working um, like three or four angles at one time, no matter what he was doing. Um, this was a building that was constructed at this um, on Lake Eloise where Cypress Gardens ended up opening. Uh, Dick Pope had been living in New York uh, during the Florida boom. He decided to come back to Florida when things crashed. And um, he, he, he got the idea for a garden because he had seen these gardens in South Carolina and he thought, well, you know, maybe I can open a garden in Florida you know, and have it be successful. So his original idea was that it would be for the city of Winter Haven, uh, that he would create this garden. It would be a public private venture. But that kind of turned into, oh, we think this sounds more like a private venture. And so uh, he ended up um, taking over it. But these are some early photos from the workers who were out there. And this building was a yacht club that had been built, I think, by the Haven Villa Corporation. And they would hold um, regattas out on the lake. Again, a lot of it was to have fun, but they were also, you know, like I said, selling uh, real estate. And this photo shows uh, the beginning of the gardens. And these are workers. This was during the Depression. So you had these workers from the works. Progress Administration out there, um, you know, doing these um, Works Progress Administration um, duties out there. And so Dick Pope got them to come out there and dig out the garden area and to prepare it. But once, once the city decided that this garden seemed more like a private venture, 
he and his friend ended up paying all the money back that they had spent um, to have these workers out there. And then Dick Pope took it over and it became Cypress Gardens. Um, and this was one of the workers, uh, one of the family members of uh, Dick, um, the Dole family. This man is named Jim Dole. And, um, and so I tracked his family down and interviewed them and his fa their father helped build the gardens, you know? And this was during the days of uh, segregation too. Um, whenever I'm working on a project, I'm always curious like um, about people of color, like were they involved? And of course they were in building a lot of these places or uh, working at the restaurants. Um, Dick Pope had a restaurant on site at the Cypress Gardens that only hired uh, black waiters. And if you look at Silver Springs, they only hired black boat captains. So that's something that's always interested me that I always try to find that part of the story too. And like I said, I had the pleasure of um, interviewing this family, the you know people that were still alive. Now this was one of the grand openings that they had at Cypress Gardens. Um, when I was doing research, you know, and I, there were like ten different grand openings. I'm like, oh my god, how many times have they opened this place? Well, Dick Pope, you know, he was a master publicist. Um, and he knew that if he advertised the grand opening, the press is going to cover it and people are going to come. So there were multiple grand openings. So it's kind of hard to determine exactly which one was the first. Um, but this was a couple of beauty queens out there. And um, what, one interesting thing about this walkway was that it was um, made out of cypress blocks, like wood cypress blocks. They had a sawmill out there. And um, I thought that was kind of cool that they had the cypress block um, walkway out there. And Dick Pope, um, the reason he chose this location, it wasn't just because the Haven Villa had a yacht club there already. He had always really loved um, the way those trees looked and the way it looked against the lake and everything. So he, he thought it was a beautiful spot. And I think he, um, he really did love, love that spot, you know. This was one of the earliest postcard, I mean, earliest brochures I could find. Um, and, and you can see here that there's a dancer on the front. So, so what Dick Pope did is he, again, to attract publicity, he would stage an event, like he would have a dancer come out there. And so she came for the opening and, and she was called the Spirit of Cypress Garden. She performed ballet out there. So he was a master of uh, getting attention back in the day. And another thing that's noteworthy about this uh, brochure is that it says on here, Winter Haven, Florida, near Bach Tower. You know, Bach Tower is in that area, and that was built in the 20s, too, I think. It's that, y'all, I'm sure if you're from down in that area, you're familiar with that. Um, Dick Pope always advertised other, um, other I, I can't really call them theme parks, but I guess attractions. Um, he always advertised other attractions because his feeling was that if you went to Bach Tower, then you could come over to Cypress Gardens and vice versa. You know, if you came to Cypress Gardens, you, you would come because you knew there were other things you could do in that area. And that's something he held on to throughout his, uh, his life, uh, managing uh, Cypress Gardens. And this is just another postcard. Um, I don't think you can see it, but it says portrait in knees. And it's a reference to the Cypress knees as well as um, this uh, dancer's knees too. So he would come up with these postcards. And this was a this was a, a photograph that was sent out to the newspaper during the time. And, and the, it had a little type notation on the back and it said Florida snowballs. Um, Dick Pope had a lot of photographers on staff. I think at one point he had like 20 photographers out there. Um, he was really big into photography, and photography was kind of new, you know. Um, but the story goes is that when he laid out Cypress Gardens, he did it like with a viewfinder. He wanted every angle at Cypress Gardens to be photo worthy because he knew that if people took photographs, they were going to share them with their friends and then they would all come to Cypress Gardens. So he was a master of, um, of the media, you know. He knew how to make things go viral before, uh, before the internet. 
And this was another, um, you know, just probably for a newsreel. It's probably a still from a newsreel because the newsreel companies love to come to Cypress Gardens. They came there pretty frequently to film uh, water sports and water activities that uh, Dick Pope put on out there. And this is a photograph of Grantland Rice. And Grantland Rice Sportlight was one of the biggest um, newsreel companies. And this is a very early shot of them at um, Cypress Garden. So Dick Pope knew all the people in the film industry just, um, and he was able to use that to his uh, benefit. Because once these newsreels went into movie theaters, then people are seeing Cypress Gardens in that way and they wanna go there. That's how he made it so uh, famous. This is another postcard um, out there having fun on the water. And then in 19, I think it was 1942, this was his first uh, time uh, working with uh, Esther Williams, you know, she had a role in this film on an island with you. And they came to, they came to Winter Haven and set up shop uh, and filmed on an island with you. And they, the newspaper devoted like a whole entire paper to all the activities surrounding this. And, um, you know, Esther Williams went to the high school dance, you know, um, they interacted with the locals. They had a really good time out there. Some of the teenagers were doubles in the film. Um, so they really interacted. And this was the first major uh, film that was made out there at the gardens. And it also was the beginning of a love-hate relationship, you know, between Dick Pope and Esther Williams. This was a back, this was a scene um, that was in the archives down there. Um, when I went to Cypress Gardens, it um it was in flux, you know, when I started working on the book project, it, it got sold a couple of times while I was trying to work on this book. And uh, at the moment that I went down there, um, the guy that owned um Wild Adventures, Kent Busher was the owner of the place. And um, he he let me into the archives, which had been damaged, you know, by hurricanes. That was one of the problems in, when when uh, Cypress Gardens was in flux in later years, where so many hurricanes came through there. But anyway, I got into the archives and Dick Pope had an amazing archive of, of photographs and negatives that were collected in this room. And it was uh, pretty crazy to get in there and look at all the photographs because he had so many photographers on staff that he photographed everything. Uh, and this is a behind the scenes photo. And there's Esther Williams in one of her early roles. Um, and that's at Cypress, you know, Cypress Gardens for On an Island with You. And this, this uh, postcard says Esther Williams diving scene. I doubt seriously that that's Esther Williams diving. I'm sure it's a double. Um, and but beneath you see these little heads bobbing around and those are some of the teenagers that went to high school down there. They got them to be the water maids. Um, and so they got to perform. But I did talk to someone who who knew that how they managed to do this diving scene is they dug a really big hole uh, right under that tree. So whoever was diving, you know, wouldn't break their neck because obviously the water's a bit shallow in that area. So that's kind of a cool old postcard. Now this photograph is, um, came out of Dick Pope's personal collection that the Pope family allowed me to check out. This is a photograph of Dick Pope. Once he enlisted in the army, um, he went to one of those I can't remember exactly which one it was, but a base nearby. But he was in the military, okay? So he had to leave Cypress Gardens. And y'all probably can't read what this says, but that's his handwriting. And it's he worked on the pole construction, putting up telephone poles. And he writes, Julie, that's his wife's name. He says, maybe the Sentinel, the Orlando Sentinel, could use one of these photos. Have a five by seven or eight by 10 sent them use something in the caption about Florida oranges are on top. Dick Pope is still publicizing them. Okay, so that was something I, I forgot to mention at the beginning, but another part of Dick Pope's early, um, his early uh, activities was orange groves, okay, and selling oranges and stuff. And so here he is 
He's advertising Florida oranges. He's advertising Cypress Gardens and he's advertising himself. And he was in the military. So I don't know, did he take a photographer with him? Because in the family album, there's um, photographs of him um, cutting up potatoes. So I think he actually had a photographer with him even when he was um, enlisted, you know, in the base nearby. Now, one of the things that coincided with um, the war were the ski shows. Cypress Gardens did not have a ski show originally, okay? Because of all the uh, newsreels and everything, they were doing they were doing things out on the water just for the newsreels, and the kids all knew how to ski because skiing was barely was brand new. The um, the water skiing thing was brand new, a brand new sport. But um, some soldiers had seen. Um, oh no! What it was was. Julia put a, there was a picture in the paper of a skier and what happened apparently, this is the myth, I don't know if it, I mean, I'm guessing it's somewhat true. A soldier called out the Cypress Gardens and asked them what time the ski show started. And Julie, there was no ski show, but Julie decided the kids will put on a ski show. So she got the kids to come on out there and put on a ski show. And that was the first ski show. The kids were out there doing it. And it took off, people loved it. Um, during World War II, because of restrictions, um, it was not, there weren't tourists coming there, there were soldiers coming there. And you can see all the soldiers there at um, Cypress Gardens uh, during the wartime, you know. Um, it was pretty much shut down to uh, the public. And Dick Pope himself, a lot of times, would supply gasoline so that the soldiers could come out there and uh, enjoy themselves. And this is an early photo from, from that period. Oops, I'm on the wrong computer. I was hitting the wrong button. Now, this is a this is a shot with a soldier crowning a queen. Now, Dick Pope crowned a lot of queens, like I'm thinking 100, maybe 200 a year. He crowned queens all the time. And the reason he did that was because he could call the press and say, we're gonna crown the chrysanthemum queen today. And then they would come out there to take photographs. So I was like doing research on this queen thing. And I came across so many uh, little news articles about so-and-so crown the queen at Cypress Gardens today. Um, and as you can see, there's a crowd there to watch the crowning happen. Um, and there's some girls in their bell dresses. The Southern Bells had no appearance yet. The Southern Bells had not b become a thing there yet, but what was going on was they would have these girls put on these costumes and then they would they would pose for photos. So that was pre the pre Southern Bell era, but they were still wearing these fancy dresses out there and they're waving goodbye to a, a group of soldiers. Now this this was the story that got told, and this photograph, this postcard, kind of summarizes it is. You have a couple of things happening in this photo. You have this tall thing of, with a plant, the flame vine on it, okay? That's a, underneath that is a, is a telephone pole, okay? Because Dick Pope worked the telephone poles when he was in the military. When he came out, he, he decided he was gonna put a telephone pole out there and drape this gigantic plant on it to get attention. Um, in one year, um, one year, what happened was there was a freeze down there. Why is it that going backwards? Let me go back. There you go. One year, there was a freeze, okay? And so Julie got the idea to take one of the girls, put her in that Southern Belle dress, and put her out front to tell everybody that, to come on in. We're open. And so that's how the Southern Belle thing got started from a freeze. They put the girls out there in the dresses, and then people just loved it. Uh, and that's how the Southern Bell thing got started at uh, Cypress Gardens, okay? Here's a picture. Um, and this, this postcard's notable too because it says a Florida blossom among grapefruit and oranges. During the time that Dick Pope was running Cypress Gardens, he was also managing the publicity for the orange industry down in that area. So he was publicizing oranges, He's publicizing Florida and he's publicizing Cypress Gardens, probably while being paid by the 
Florida Citrus Commission, okay, because he's running their advertising, but he's also, you know, selling Cypress Gardens. And he was famous for that. Uh, here's another one. He's selling, he's selling the bells, the oranges, and Cypress Gardens. And I found a lot of photographs where he was using the oranges. This is where they made a whole big Florida orange thing out there next to the, um, the yacht club. Um, so he's, he's working in Cypress Gardens wherever he can. And this was just a, a photo, photograph of photographers. Like I said, uh, photographs, you know, cameras were just becoming popular and um, he used that to his advantage um, in publicizing um, Cypress Gardens. Now here's here's a news release that went out. So he, it says he uh, queen, he crowned a hundred queens a year, and uh, like I said, this is the gardenia queen. And uh, like I said, when I was looking up things, these are some of the clippings I came across, and I was copying them, and I was photocopying them at first. And then I'm like, man, there's a thousand of them, you know, uh, because he crowned the egg queen, queen of the fiesta, the oleander queen. And a lot of times um, he would get the skiers. Uh, he would call a skier up and say, hey, I need you to come over to Cypress Gardens today. We're going to crown you as a queen. Uh, so the skiers would come out there and they would be queens. And uh, I had a lot of funny stories about that. One skier said she had to go dry her hair off so she could go get crowned um, as a queen. So he was using that to publicize um, Cypress Gardens. And then he had, you know, little places tourists could take pictures out there. Uh, again, he knew they were going to end up in photo albums and people were going to see them and they were going to want to go there too. Well, this is the family that I showed you at the very beginning that I um, interviewed, the Dole family, and their father helped build Cypress Gardens. And um, some of the, the boys here ended up growing up and becoming uh, waiters out there at the restaurant. Like I said, they only hired black waiters out there. And um, it was a thing at the time, I guess. Um, and so they actually, this family, when I went to their home uh, and they graciously invited me to come over and to do the interview, they had one of these little suits, one of these little Easter suits. Um, still preserved, they still have it. And this photo was made on Easter day at Cypress Gardens. I think it was made in like 1942. And so this is probably the very first black family to visit as tourists there, even though it was still segregated. Um, you know, one of the weird things, um, if you study Florida history, you'll come across references to Negro Day. And some of the parks in Florida would have one day a year where African Americans could go to the park. It's, it's kind of a bizarre thing, but they would have one day where they could go. And uh, the Doles family thought it was on Palm Sunday that they were allowed to come out there. And they think that Dick Pope actually brought the family there uh, for a visit. You know, um, This is just another couple of uh, African Americans that worked out there taking a picture at Cypress Gardens. These are the skiers. Like I said, the skiers, um, you know, skiing was in its infancy when Dick Pope started, you know, and he made it, um, he really popularized it. He wrote uh, books about it. He wrote, um, he wrote, he, he got uh, whole spreads in magazines, Life magazine, Look magazine, all these magazines. I think, I think uh, National Geographic did some pieces on that. Um, because skiing was just taking off as a, as a sport. They ended up manufacturing skis out there. So they really got into the whole uh, skiing thing. Now, let me show you this. This is a little film and we're gonna see how well this works. Hopefully I'll be able to move to my next slide after this. Uh, let me make sure the sound's working, okay? Looks like it is. Y'all hear that? Can y'all hear yes, me? We, we hear it, Lou. Thanks. Okay, great. I just wanted to double check. Okay, we're going to watch this little cheesy film, y'all. Pretty girls make a pretty picture. 
where sky and water meet, you'll find water tournaments, beauty contests, festivals, and ski ballets. Together, these spell aquatic wizardry. And here at Cypress Gardens, Florida, ski schools start at any age, but the younger the better. The only requirement is ability to swim. This part of the curricula is called the ground school. After the chalk talks, our skilings learn proper posture and balance. All this and school too? But don't get me wrong, these ski school marms not only teach water skiing, but are proficient in swimming, modeling, and acting. The first water test is always exciting. There are no ringers here. This is positively the first try on water for this bunch. Mass instruction works best because the kids have less tendency to allow their feet to spread. Watch the faces take on confidence as the kids gain experience. Water skiing is not difficult. Almost anybody from 6 to 60 can learn to do this well after a one-hour lesson. Happy landings are easy, too. You simply drop the rope and glide for shallow water until your momentum's out. A rough house is good for young water skiers. It inspires relaxation regardless of how you get tossed about. Water skiing plays no favorites. The girls do equally as well as the boys. watch a senior girls class make a practice run. Our cameraman insists it's easier to ski downhill, but we straightened him out. See you later, girls. How early should youngsters start skiing on their own? That's hard to say, but here's a nine-year-old outboard skipper towing a seven-year-old skier. He's just a beginner, but with this kind of concentration, he'll develop surprising skill. As soon as they learn to stay on the boards, next step is tricks. The pyramid makes a good starter in this department. They made it. Starting from 10 feet underwater, this scholar will demonstrate the art of shoe skiing. It looks easy, but actually they are prone to catching edges, which would cause a spill. Greater speed is needed for this stunt. Alfredo Mendoza, one of the greats in water skiing, stepping lightly off the boards at 38 miles per hour. He doesn't need skis. His bare feet will do nicely. He says it's easy if you don't wiggle your toes. There's only one way to stop. Just let go. This young lady is showing us the type of ski used for the single ski technique. Next is the regulation or two ski type. It has less depth to the fin on the bottom. And the third is wider with no fin. It is used for turning and jumping. Hey, fellas, are you listening? The single ski technique, while different, is just as easy to perform. It has more grace and style and allows the skier to operate in wider angles. Let's watch Willa McGuire. She's led the women's world in water skiing for many years. Her artistry and skill have no equal on the aquatic hickories. Now, Willa tries the impossible, a ski ballet with no hand or foothold.
popular form of modern water skiing is sometimes called the romantic double. a kiss. No? Goodbye. Here's hoping this romantic pair have a happier ending. Alfredo is warming up again. This time it's for the jumps. He holds the world's record of well over a hundred feet in board jumping. Let's watch him again in slow motion. Notice the arms do not rotate like on snow ski jumping. He's just sailing along. Alfredo's next is called the helicopter spin. He'll try to do a double spin. It's never been done before, and it takes nerve to try. Almost, but not quite. This time, the Mexican jumping bean will do a one and a half spin on the ramp, landing backwards and completing the other half on water. Brother, this seems harder than the double spin. doesn't like to get his feet wet coming ashore. The triple straight jump has crowd appeal. Once more for the cameraman. This is the shot he was after. Where's the third fellow? He's chicken, never jumped at all. Believe it or not, even water skiers get down with that old bugaboo monotony. When that happens, the boys play a little game. They call it the Cypress Gardens Weave. Well, I hope they're all pepped up because I'm exhausted. Yes, water skiing today is a big sport, and here is a big send-off from the whole gang. So long. Okay, it worked. Um, that film brought up a couple of points. One was um, skiing became really popular largely, you know, Dick Pope had a really big hand in that. And they had um, international competitions in skiing at Winter Haven and his skiers would go to France. They would go all over the world to these big ski competitions. And there were international champions at Cypress Gardens. Uh, Alfredo Mendoza, who they, referred to uh, in the film, actually came to Cypress Gardens after seeing a newsreel. He decided to come up there and ski. And Willa, Willa McGuire, who they also mentioned, she was a world champion skier. She did things nobody else could do, uh, including on that little single ski, which they call the jitterboard. Um, she's not attached to anything. She's literally balancing on that thing. And um, she said that only women were able to do that. The men could never master that. But she was famous for uh, back doing back jumps off these big ski ramps. And she traveled all over the world. And that was one thing that I thought that made Winter Haven unique was all these people from all over the world would come there. Um, Dick Pope was good friends with um, the King of Jordan. You know, they would come and put put their camps there, they would come and visit there. So it was kind of an international um, hot spot, which was kind of strange because it, it's kind of in the middle of, you know, it's in the middle of Florida, you know, and you have people from all over the world coming there. So what you have here is some of the, some of the magazine covers that Pope got. Um, he had a wall in his office with just 
magazine covers. You know, he was real proud of the fact that he was able to get all these magazine covers because he really, like I said, he knew how to work the media. Um, and so skiing was part of that. These are some of the covers they got, um, you know, from the magazines. Um, and here's a group of women on these jitterboards. You can see that they're barefoot. They're just literally balancing. They're not even holding on. Um, and how hard that was to do. Uh, these are athletes. Um, a lot of these skiers were total athletes, okay? And some of them, some of these skiers doubled as, um, they would double as Southern Bells, you know? So they would ski and then they would go put on their Southern Bell outfit and then pose out on the lawn. Um, so it's kind of interesting. This is one of the skiers. She's, she's in a Southern Bell outfit here, but she's also on the cover of Life magazine as a champion skier. So that was kind of a unique thing about Cypress Gardens um, was the level of the sport. There's her, um, there's her uh, cover of Life magazine. This was up in Pope's office. And here's the Florida pool. Now this brings about the second, um, well, the second interaction with Esther Williams. Um, she, she filmed the movie Easy to Love. And if you've never seen it, you should watch it. It's, it's about Cypress Gardens um, and Dick Pope, really, you know. Um, and he built this Florida pool for that film. And he, he justified it because he's like, you know, we're going to get so much publicity off this film and we're going to have uh, so many different ways of using this pool and the pool's still there. When I was doing research on the book, the pool had fallen into disrepair. But when Legoland purchased the property and took over, um, I think a few years ago, they renovated um, the pool. I don't know that they let people swim in it, but it's renovated. And if you look at carefully, you can see all the skiers on the edge of the pool sitting there. So that's another publicity shot for Dick Pope. And there's Dick Pope. And I really love this photograph of him. Um, everyone talked about how hyper he was. They thought maybe he had attention deficit disorder because he would do 10,000 things at one time. And here he's eating talking on the phone and probably talking to somebody in the room at the same time. Uh, he was always multitasking. He could not spell. I looked at some of the documents he wrote himself and he was a terrible speller, but he was a genius. He was a genius at marketing. Uh, and they call him, you know, later, you know, they came to refer to him as the man who invented Florida, you know, Mr. Florida, um, because of his, um, the way he really brought, um, you know, the industry, the um, attractions to Florida. And he always noticed his suit is very shiny. He always wore very colorful clothes. And he said, because he's a short man, he wore very uh, colorful clothes so people would notice him. And this is just a, a shot of the crowds before, um, before they built, they have a stadium now where you can watch the ski shows, but back in the beginning, they didn't have a stadium and people would just sit out on the grass. And I'm always impressed with how dressed up everybody is. Now there's Esther Williams um, out there for Easy to Love uh, for the ski show. You know, her and Dick Pope had a crazy relationship. She actually wrote about him in her um, autobiography. Um, they had a real love-hate relationship, but he was always building swimming pools for her. He did another swimming pool for a TV show that she did. He built a swimming pool for her. He built the Florida pool. You know, he was always, um, he knew that how famous she was and she was gonna help him and he was gonna help her. And this is, this is Alfredo Mendoza, the uh, Mexican guy. He doubled for uh, Esther Williams and easy to love. There's a couple of scenes where there's some really big jumps. And um, uh, and and you can see he's wearing the he's wearing the same swimsuit she wore, and he's got on the crown. But uh, he was doubling for her in some of those scenes in the film. And this is a scene a still from Easy to Love. They filled the pool with all these flowers, and uh, that's a scene. Uh, this is how he used the swimming pool afterward. Filled it with oranges. Has a queen out there. He's got all the stuff he always liked to publicize: oranges, Florida. Southern Bells and Beauty Queens all together in one shot. And this was just a, a scene. On the left, it says Florida Filmland. And one thing uh, 
one thing somebody told me about Dick Pope is he had he had studios there that people could work at. Um, and basically he told them, he named it Studio B, so they would think there was a Studio A, there wasn't. Um, so he would, he would say, well, Studio B is available, you know. Um, he, he always knew how to hype things up. Um, these are some shots for some other uh, things. They filmed Cinerama down there. Cinerama was a, uh, where they used a camera that had, as you can see here, it was a unique camera that had three different um, viewfinders on it. So it was like this um, 3D kind of experience. And they filmed down there too. Um, this is a shot of a skier. They're using kind of some of that Esther Williams uh, costuming here. This was just a, a later uh, ad from uh, a billboard on the side of the road, postcards. I know I'm getting to the end of my thing here. I have to speed up a little bit. This picture has the uh, boats in it. Um, they had built these canals through there, uh, dug them out. You wouldn't be able to do that now. Uh, and they'd since dried up. But back in the day, they would take a little motorboat through, well, an electric boat through there, and they would show off all their... Um, all the surroundings and the gardens and everything. These are some of the aquamaids. I really just like looking at vintage. And there's uh, Willa. She's the famous skier, and that's Dick Pope on a on a thing next to her. They were doing this shot, I think, for Life or Look magazine. Uh, and when they slowed down the uh, boat, this thing sank, and the piano fell in the water. Uh, and he made sure they got a picture of that, too, because he was going to use it in some form or fashion later. There's Willa, championship skier. She's a world champion. I'm not sure. Um, she was living in uh, the land when I interviewed her. And here's another little video. We'll watch this. Okay, I want to make sure... We arrived just in time to watch the famous Aquamaids, who have been featured in many movies performing in the water ski show. are performed by the Aquamaze, ski champions, and experts to please thousands of visitors. Such scenes as these can be photographed from a special camera pier with nationally known cameramen and photographers to assist all visitors. now are walking in all directions. Some leave to go elsewhere, and others decide to walk through the winding paths of the garden. And this is beautiful Cypress Garden, with its beautiful landscape grounds, known the world over as America's tropical wonderland. Electric boat tours take the visitors through the winding waterways and through flower bank canals for one of the loveliest boat trips in the world. Here you will find thousands of the most beautiful flowering shrubs from all parts of the globe. 
Many different varieties in bloom may be seen no matter what the season. Rare and exotic plants form a paradise of beauty and a mecca for millions of visitors each year. So that was a home movie. I, I love that because you get to see all the parts of, um, of Cypress Gardens in that little film and you see how, every, how everybody's so dressed up and everything. Um, and this is a photo of, of Dick Pope uh, with one of the signs out, outside of um, the area. Souvenir here, all the different pieces. Uh, and this is the photo pier she mentioned. Um, Dick Pope saw that um, people were having trouble taking photos because somebody would stand up in front of him. So what he did is he charged them a quarter to sit on this pier. So he, get, he charged them to sit there and they had for photographers to help them set their camera so they'd get a good photo. And they always made sure that the ski show thing went right by there. So it's called a photographic pier. Uh, and that's where those photographers would sit. So he knew the power of photography uh, really early on. This is just a newsreel shot. Um, he would also give them a little pen so they could be the guest photographer. You know, that would, they get that for their little money they paid to sit up there. Um, these are some of the ads. Um, people would um, want to sell things and Dick Pope was always getting trucks and boats. He had a connection with Chris Craft and they would sell boats because he used their boats. Um, so he always had a connection uh, with companies and selling Cypress Gardens and whatever it was he was selling, okay? Um, this is one of those kites. You can see the guys pretty much hanging on that thing. Later, I think they started using safety harnesses and stuff. There might be a harness on there, but um, I did talk to a guy who crashed one of those um, and ended up in the hospital. And this is just a, a photo of the skiers out there. I love this slide. It's from the original before they had the um, this, um, before they had the pier out there or the you know stadium for people to sit at. And there's Dick Pope. He made it as he made his own floor to seal, and he tried to get the state to pay him for it. As you can see, he's got a, he's got a glass bottom boat out there to represent Silver Springs and the skis uh, to represent uh, Cypress Gardens. And here he is. Um, you may not remember, but I do. Mike Douglas had a TV show back in the day, and uh, they filmed for a couple of weeks out there the Mike Douglas show, and they had the yellow elephant obviously painted. Uh, and there's Dick Pope in one of his outfits. Um, these are, there's Mike Douglas with Muhammad Ali who came uh, down there to Cypress Gardens as did Duke Ellington. You know, there were all these really famous people that came there for this show. That's Duke Ellington at Cypress Garden. There's Johnny, uh, Johnny Carson came there. Johnny Carson, the only time he ever left the studio to film a show, he did it at Cypress Gardens. That's how famous Cypress Gardens was, and it's kind of hard to, looking at that little film, it's like, it was a garden. It was a garden that had a ski show, but it was so, people just loved it. You know, I don't know, there was something really special about um, about going there. And this this is a clip from um, the TV show. Esther Williams did this really bizarre TV show. It was almost like an ad for beer, but she's swimming underwater in this pool. Um, and that's a scene from that. This is another scene from the little TV show where uh, Dick Pope made her a special pool for that. It had windows in the side so the filmmaker could sit by those windows and film it. They ended up filling it in, I guess, at some point. 
this guy came down there with a boat, you know, a flying boat um, to, to advertise his flying boat, and they ended up using it in shows. And here's Dick Pope, and this guy here, that is uh, Walt Disney's brother, Roy. Okay, this was when Disney came. I'm getting to the end here because I know I'm running out of time. Um, Walt, Walt Disney and them, before they found, you know, before they opened um, down at Orlando, they were checking sites out. And so one of the sites they checked out was Cypress Gardens. And there's a story that when Roy Disney came to Cypress Gardens, he got on the phone and called Walt and said, you won't believe it. They're charging this much money for people to come see a garden. I think this area is a good area, you know, uh, but that's uh, Roy Disney out there. And this is Dick Pope at Disney at the castle when it was being built. Dick Pope, like many of the attraction owners, welcomed Disney. They welcomed Disney because they thought it would be good for their business. They thought it would be like the old days. You know, Bach Tower would advertise Cypress Gardens because they knew if you came to Bach Tower, you could also go to Cypress Gardens. And they thought that would happen with um, Disney. And originally, in the very beginning, it was a good thing because Disney only let a certain number of tourists in per day. And then the overflow would go to Cypress Gardens or they would go to Wiki Watch or they would go to another park. But then that gradually changed because Disney kept adding more and more worlds. They added hotels. Disney got to the point where they wanted Americans on their one week vacation or two week vacation to come to Disney and never leave. Okay, and that's what ended up being the demise of all these other attractions. Dick Pope tried to counter Disney's attack, you know, by bringing in these really oversized big things and topiaries and bells and whistles and all that, but it was no match. Uh, these are some of the giant topiaries they brought in. He was trying to, you know, let's, we have big things too, but it was too much. Disney was too much. Um, and this was one of the early, uh, this is a one, two, three, four, five level uh, ski thing. Uh, when I got there, this was what was there. There were only three or four skiers left um, at the park um, and that was it. And then this was back in the day of the Southern Bells and um, this young lady, they ended up hiring some African-American Bells, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I talked to one of these Black Bells. I'm like, you, you know, what's the deal with the Southern Bell? Oh, it's better than working at Walgreens, you know? Plus we get to wear these dresses. So that was happening uh, later too. Um, when I finished the book, the park had gone through several different sales. It was very complicated at the end, too complicated to get into, but Legoland ended up buying it, okay? And that was better than the whole area getting turned into condominiums, which was probably going to be the next thing that happened. So Legoland bought it. They preserved the original footprint of the gardens. They saved the Florida pool. And now, um, you know, now Cypress Gardens is Legoland. Okay, so the Southern Bells are now Lego Southern Bells. So that, that's there. And I don't know how many of you have been there. If you've been there, I want to know about it. I need to go down and visit it. So I think we might have a couple minutes. I know I went over the time. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to um, take your questions. Lou, that was fantastic. Well, it's a lot to cover. And sure. <laughs> the story was huge. Like when I started writing the book, I knew nothing about skiing, you know, but I learned a lot about it over the course of writing the book and interviewing skiers, you know. One of the people that I work with at the library told me yesterday that she has a pair of skis, Dick Pope skis, that right. her family bought for her uh, when she was 13 so that she could learn how to ski. And she never did. She tried, but she couldn't do it. But they, she still has them. She has them um, as decoration on her porch. <laughs> well, they're collectible, collectible um, if you come across them. Um, because, you know, they started manufacturing them out there. You know, they became so famous that they had their own factory to make the skis, you know, so. If anybody has any questions or any feedback for Lou, feel free to unmute yourselves. I'm going to stop recording now. Thanks for joining, but stay yeah. on. If you have any questions. <laughs>